All right, we are live. Welcome back, everybody, to another weekly episode of Sports to Suits Live. I am your host, Amanda Banks, and weekly I have the opportunity to highlight amazing former athletes that are crushing it in business now. We get to dive into their stories on how they're leveraging sports to see success in business. And I could not be more excited this week than to have my now friend who I've had the, the honor of getting to know over the past several months, Patrick Johnson on. So Patrick, thank you so much for joining in today. Hello. These are exciting <laughs> times and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, awesome. I'm super excited to dive into all of the fun things that you have going on. They are quite impressive. So we're going to dive into all of that stuff. But as people are popping in, please drop us a comment so that you you know or you can let us know that we are live and that you are able to tune into the show. And if there's any questions that you have as we go through the conversation, please drop those comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We've had people literally tune in from all over the world and continue to do so. So it's always exciting for me to kind of see who's who's jumping in on these awesome conversations. But while I'm checking on everything, Patrick, why don't you share with the audience a little bit about your background and what you have going on? Well, the story for me in basketball starts with with me. And I think I was like 1987. I was like 10 years old and I'm out in a dirt field with my mom. So I come out early in the morning and I see my mom and my older brother playing basketball. They have a bucket that they've nailed to the tree. There's no court there. What? It's just dirt. And, um, and so I want to know what they're doing. This is how I got introduced to the game of basketball. And so I see them shooting and it seems like fun. And so I say, I want to play. And so she gives me, I dribble the first time and it picks up a sticker and the sticker goes in my hand. And I'm like, no, thanks. <laughs> but then she, she forces me. She says, you will dribble that ball. And she would not let me leave until I dribbled and I ended up becoming one of the best ball handlers in my family after that. But that's kind of how I got introduced to the game. Did you, did you find joy in it? Like, was it something that you eventually like found a lot of passion and love for? Or was it something that you yeah. kind of stuck with because of your family? Absolutely. There's joy in it. Every, every serious basketball player knows what I'm talking about. When, <laughs> when I say the sound of the ball going through that net, it, it's, there's nothing like it. <laughs> like the, the, it's the instant reward that tells you you did everything right to make that ball go in. And you just want more and more and more of it. So tell me more about your basketball journey. So we have some folks popping in here. We've got Lorenzo Leakes, number 24 from Eugene, Oregon. Thank you for tuning in. It's good to see you again. And we've got Jason tuning in from Tulsa as well. Jason always asks the best questions. So I'll be excited to see what he puts in here in the comments here in a bit as well. But like, tell me about your basketball journey. So you got started in basketball. Did you play in high school or college or professionally? Like, um, What's a little bit of your journey with basketball? Well, most of my experience in basketball, the most intense moments were with my family. So I had four brothers. So there were five boys. And then my mom was a serious player. Like my mom used to whip boys when she was growing up. So she introduced all of us. With her, we had two teams of three. And so we would have these intense battles in our backyard. We would play to 200 no one would want to quit. If the game was over, they'd be saying, get back out here and let's finish, let's play another one. And so we had some intense battles just among me and my brothers and my mom. And then when I started playing organized ball, I picked it up in high school. So I played my freshman year, played my sophomore year. Um, I was taller than everyone else on the team. So they kept putting me in the polls. And I didn't want to play the polls. I grew up in the Jordan era. Jordan's the shooting guard. So I, I had trained myself to play like a shooting guard. And so I was tired of being put in the polls by my sophomore year. When the time came for me to transfer or move up to varsity, I had a talk with the varsity coach and I told him, I'm not playing in that post. <laughs> and he said, Patrick, we're going to put you wherever we feel you can best help the team. And I said, and that's the post, right? He said, yeah, that's the post. And I said, OK, well, I quit. And so I, that that ends my journey with organized basketball right there. I, I really wish I had had a mentor who, were, who had told me, hey, just play where they put you and prove you can play the other spots. Yeah. I think I, I would have gone a lot further. So that's where my participation in it ends. But then I followed my brothers all the way through college. I ended up becoming the sports editor at my university newspaper. And so I would do the stories on my brothers who were on the varsity team for the university. That, that probably helped get a little bit of publicity to, to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, every story was the only one. <laughs> that was a good end, right? All, all about them, every page. No, I, I, I spread it out pretty evenly. Um, yeah, I, I think I was pretty fair about it, but I really love that experience. So 
not only was I the sports editor for the newspaper, but I traveled with the team and I filmed their games. So I got to see all of the matches. I got to travel with the team. I knew the players and everything. Um, that's kind of how the idea for Rimpage came about. Um, and I, I guess we can get into that a little bit later. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, did you always enjoy writing? Was it something that you were good about? Because I would imagine like being an editor, you have to be a pretty, pretty solid writer. And that's something that, you know, is not a passion of mine. I do do some of that work. <laughs> right. But but going into that, was it something that you like absolutely loved or did you just like being in that atmosphere or environment? I I love words. I, I, I believe it was for Father's Day one year. My wife asked me, what did I want? I told her I wanted a dictionary. That was years ago. I still have that dictionary. And from time to time, I'll just pick it up and read it. I, I read the dictionary. <laughs> I oh love words. And so when I was in high school, um, when I was in high school, I wanted I was fascinated with Shakespeare because he could do things with words that would take you places. And I think all of that just kind of made it a good fit for me being sports editor. So what did you do outside of school? So because you, you've got quite the interesting journey. So you went from college into the labor force and now you're kind of going back into incorporating your love and your passions for sports back into what you're doing. But so tell me a little bit about like when you transitioned out of college, like what did that look like for you? Well, being at the university newspaper taught me that I wanted to be in journalism. I, I knew I wanted to do something that had to do with words. I didn't know the journalism major existed, so I chose the next closest thing, which was English. So I majored in English, and then I also knew I wanted to be involved in sports, so I switched to kinesiology, and then I switched to English. And I, I kind of bounced around between the two of them. But I remember I was in this one particular class in, um, in kinesiology, and the, the, my professor was just going on and on about, uh, on about how this guy is great, and this guy's doing great things, and this guy's doing great things. And I'm thinking, I want to do great things. And I, I kind of got tired of it. And that kept happening over and over again. And so I kind of had this idea that I wanted to start my own magazine. And so I said, OK, in this one particular day in class, I said, if this, if this professor calls my name three times, I'm dropping out of college today. And I'm going to start this magazine. He never called on me in class. But that particular day, he called on me three times. And I said, well, I left that class and said goodbye to college. I went to the registrar's office and dropped and then immediately started working on this magazine. So that so was the idea. Like, I mean, <laughs> well, because, so for those that you're tuning in, so you have like, I've so much enjoyed just like your zest and passion for like people, but also your spirituality and faith and like seeing right. a vision and carrying out that vision, but not being like concerned about winning or losing. Like it's more about how do you continue to follow your path and give it your all. So like what happened with the magazine? Is it something that you're still doing or was it like, tell me a little bit about um, that journey. What it was it, or what it ended up being is a step that just moved me one step closer to Rimpage because the work I was doing with that magazine, I'm doing today. Uh, the work that I was doing for the Rambler at the university newspaper, I'm doing today. And so it, it just ended up being a step. Um, I did, I think maybe two, two or three issues that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> it wasn't wildly successful, but I love the work. I love, I, I learned part of it. that I like, love That is interviewing absolutely people. part of it. Right, yeah. I love hearing people's stories. I love interviewing people. I love taking a picture of somebody and putting a headline underneath it and <laughs> making something big out of that story. In fact, there's one thing that happened. I'll, I'll tell you when uh, when I was at the <laughs> at the university newspaper. So I did this one story on this picture, and I made this picture huge, and I put a huge headline, and I did this long story on him. And the the newspaper came out. We finished it every Monday. It came out to the the university every Wednesday. So. There was this buzz all around campus that Wednesday, and I'm just looking around, and I'm, I'm seeing people looking at the paper and everything. I didn't know what was going on. And then I started hearing little things, and, and I could tell I had something to do with the baseball players. And sure enough, I got a call from the, the coach of the baseball team. He called me into his office, and I'm like, what happened? And he was like, listen, if you need a story about baseball, come talk to us. That guy you interviewed is our third stream pitcher. He'll never get on the field. You made him look like a superstar. And now all of the other players are jealous. They're wondering why they didn't get that kind of attention. But I, 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 I learned the power of words and, and where you point that camera right there. And I'm, I'm doing that same thing for rim page athletes. 
I absolutely love this. So we've got a couple of other people popping in here. Thank you, Brian. Nice to see you. We've got John Coleman popping in from New Jersey. So if you're tuning in and you didn't drop us a comment earlier, I see a bunch of people are in here live. So definitely let us know that you're in here listening so we can give you a shout out. Um, but I do want to go back. So here's another thing that you're fascinated with. And I, I, have, um, I have become fascinated with it too, just due to your curiosity around some of the stuff that I've got going on. But you have this thing that you like know a lot about. And I dropped a link in the comment <laughs> called 16 Personalities. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. And I took it and Patrick took it. But if you're listening in live, it, it takes a couple of seconds. Like it's not a long test at all. Definitely fill us out and drop us a comment on what your personality is based on this test. But share a little bit more about oh, kind of your boy. fascination around personalities and how did you get into this? This this was pivotal for me. Okay. Learning or coming across this research. It started when I took this one test uh, one time. It the guy was he was saying take this test and we'll tell you where you are most likely to be um, charismatic and meet people. And it was, are you a J or P, which happens to be the last letter of the four letter types. And so I took that test and it turned out I was a J or something. And then I started getting more curious about where, where, what is this research? Where did you get this from? Then I came across 16 personalities, pivotal moment for me, because what it did for me is it showed me, it introduced me to myself. I had known, or I had been observing myself for years. Like I noticed these things about me and I just thought I was weird. But then when I, I took Tess was telling me who I am in words and explaining it better than I could explain it. And it just blew me away, the accuracy of it. Like I've heard about astrology and, and um, the zodiac signs and stuff like that, but I, I haven't come across anything that is as accurate as this. And so I just became fascinated. I, I would ask complete strangers, here, take this test. <laughs> it takes 12 minutes, take this test. I'm well, serious, I would ask me. complete strangers, <laughs> anyone who was around me, my, my wife and children, I made them take it. The people at church, the people at my job, my coworkers, I made everyone take it because I began to wonder, okay, what's his type and what's her type and what's her type? And I would hear people talk and I say, okay, that sounds like this type. And sure enough, I would ask them, have you ever taken this test? And they say, no, I'm, hey, take the test, take the test. I would text them later on that night. Hey, did you take the test? What was your result? <laughs> because uh, the one thing I'm looking for is, is I'm looking for one person who gets a result and reads the profile and said, no, nah, that's not me. That doesn't scare me. I haven't found one yet. <laughs> And so, so I took it like you were like, Amanda, you've got to take this test. So I took it and there were a little bit of components that weren't necessarily in alignment. And I think that that's just mm -hmm. because of, you know, some of the work, like where I'm at right now in my life. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like some of this stuff, like I have to receive feedback and all of these things for anybody listening. I am an ENFJ and Patrick, you are a ENTP. <laughs> ENTP. So the part that I'm talking about is constructive criticism. Like I crave constructive criticism right now, but the, the testing is like, doesn't do well with constructive criticism. Uh -huh. But that was the, like literally the only thing that I was like, Oh, well, everything else makes perfect sense. I, I can tell already you're an e ENFJ. Like when you told me it just fit like a puzzle piece <laughs> because you all, you all inspire people to be their best. You are what's missing and that motivational piece that's missing that lets a person know I can do this. And you all do that so well. ENFJs do that so well. Um, but what the reason I, I became fascinated with it was if you know a person's personality type, it's like getting an instant five year head start getting to know them. There are things that you just automatically know because you know their personality type. And that's very useful. I think um, I found out that Hollywood uses it in casting characters. Our government uses oh, it, wow. FBI uses it, um, a lot of its employers use it. That research is widely used and it's widely researched. So we have Corey Argenbright uh, jumping in here. He is an ENTJ-A. <laughs> the boss. <laughs> what does that mean, Patrick? <laughs> he, he's the boss. He's in command. There are other people who follow the rules. He makes the rules. <laughs> I mean, I am all for that. <laughs> they, they are type A personalities that let's get this done. This is what we're doing. Don't cry. Hey, what are you crying about? Stop crying over there. Get the job. This is what we got to do. That That's them. And I am they, like they know so curious going. now. I'm probably going to go over here into LinkedIn and see exactly what Corey does. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what else it did for me, Amanda, is it helped me find my place. Like once you know what your type is and you read that description, and especially if it resonates with you, then you can start to put yourself in places that make the best use of your strengths. And for me, that was entrepreneurship. Like, uh, 
This makes sense. So co-founder, military community, chamber of commerce, and head football coach. <laughs> head football coach. <laughs> Might wear the highway. <laughs> we are doing this drill, and if you don't like it, get off the team. <laughs> well, but th that you're so right. And like, so there's another one called Strengths Finder. Yes. That um that I really like because it gives like not it gives strengths and weaknesses, but it really kind of pinpoints some of the whys and some of the things that like make sense. And so I, I had the opportunity to do to work on a small group or a small team on a project. And what was really fascinating to me is they basically had us all take this test and they put us in roles, not necessarily based on like what our backgrounds were or what, you know, our titles were, but really like what our strengths were. And they mm -hmm. compensated for what weaknesses were. So if I was stronger in one area versus another area, they would put me in that area. And so, so they did it based on a team dynamic. Do you kind of see this as far as like the 16 personality stuff, as yeah. well as how you like build out a team and an ecosystem? Absolutely. And that's, I, I, I think the, the way to make the best use of that is to understand what each person's type is so that, so that you can put them in areas where they thrive, where they, they have a natural energy for it. They don't have to fight. Like this is what they would do if they were all for it. They would do it for fun. That you can get splendid results from people when when they're doing the thing that they love and they're operating in an area of strength. And it's Corey's good. saying he wears many, many hats. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that that would definitely make sense for sure. So we've yeah. got so Jason's popping in. And like I said, he always has the best questions. So I want to I want to pop in with a couple of questions, but I do want to spend a lot of time on what Rimpage is because I'm okay. fascinated with this whole process of starting out an entire new league. Like I would yes. love to dive into that story, but before we get into that, I want to ask a couple of these questions. Cause like I said, okay. I always ask the best ones. He said, what is the most humbling and rewarding experience that you've been a part of? This could be professionally or personally. The most humbling and rewarding I think it would be when I, I got my first athlete, my first Rimpage athlete. Um, I, I had spent all this time working. Like the Rimpage, I really got serious about Rimpage in 2017. No one heard about it until 2000, like last year. So all that time, I was in the weeds. I was in the desert, in the dark, <laughs> trying to find my way. And some of that time or, or so many hours I poured into designing this website. And then I found myself on a call talking to an athlete and I was walking him through the, the website. He's, this is an athlete. This is the market that I want to serve. And he's on my website and I'm guiding him through. And that moment did something to me because it's like the thing that I've been creating all this time, this person over here is benefiting from it. And that, that kind of woke me up. Like, this is real. This, this, I've arrived. This is where I want to be. I love that. Brian popped in and said an ESFP dash A. Not quite sure. So what's up with what's up with Brian? <laughs> Adventures. Okay, here's the thing about them. <laughs> the the one thing you don't want to do with them is bore them. Uh, I, I have four children. All of them are in that category. They the bored, being bored is the worst thing you could <laughs> that could happen to them. So they 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 need the excitement. They don't plan well for the future. They are all about what's happening in this moment. What are the opportunities present in this moment that I can take advantage of to have fun? It's all about fun. They don't like the heavy stuff in life, like the politics and the wars going on over there. It's just, they're, they're the ones who help us not to take life so seriously. Oh, I love that. And he says, uh, he said, love the different tests. He uses DISC and it makes a big difference. As Pat says, it gives you a head start and allows other people, right. allows getting people aligned quickly to see right. to be successful. You know what else it, it did for me, Amanda? When it, when I read the results, I read my results and I and and everything was so accurate. I just kind of sat back for a moment and I thought, wow, I I thought I was unique. <laughs> so so there was a sadness there because so much of who I am and what I do and how I think and how I view the world is all a part of an, an attribute of my personality type. Not a hundred percent of it, but so much of it is. And I thought it was me. I thought I was unique. So and in one sense, I was sad. But in the other sense, I was very happy to learn that there are other people out there who have my type, who have my same kind of experience, my same worldview, kind of like to talk about the same things I like to talk about, struggle with the same things. So in another, another sense, it's not bad to be alone. So you have you met another one? Like, have you spent a lot of time with somebody with your exact personality type? <laughs> 
Not, <laughs> not a lot of time. For one thing, we only make up 3% of the population. There are not many of us at all, um, wow. especially female ENTPs. They are ex extremely rare. Um, okay, so, so if you're tuning in and you take this test and you are a female ENTP, please reach out to Patrick. <laughs> reach out, reach out. Because one thing, I'm, I'm extremely curious about people. And so I really do want to meet other ENTPs and just pick their brains. Pick their brains. That, that's what we do. We pick brains. Like we we want to analyze every part of your mind. I, I, could, I could walk the corridor with other people like watching a movie. I could listen to you tell me about your vacation and it will be as fun to me as being on that vacation. It's just, I'm, I'm just intensely curious about people. And that is true. You asked me a ton of questions yes. and try to like dive super deep into some of like my thought process and the way that yes. I process information. Yeah. yeah. So and if, it's, you it's, want, if you want a, like a really deep conversation that like sparks, like that's inspirational or motivational, but like gets you thinking a little bit differently, like reach out to Patrick and the two of you need to Please chat because, <laughs> because that like every time you and I chat, it's always about like ideas, curiosity, yeah. like, you know, what are we dreaming out, dreaming up on this like really big perspective and like, how are we going to change the world? Like that's how yeah. you reach out to <laughs> your title was. Oh, those are my I'm favorite things. World. Yeah. Those are my favorite things to talk about. Me too. So we've got, let's pop into one more question and then I want to dive into, oh, that's already been asked. Okay. So continuous improvement looks different to everybody. What does continu continuous improvement mean to you and why is it important? Oh my goodness. That's, that's one of the pillars of the ENTP is, is why we make such great entrepreneurs because we're always asking the question, how could this be improved? So you show me, a si especially systems, show me how this works. And the first thing I'm asking is, well, what if we tried this? Would that make it better? Um, and so we, I do the same thing with myself. Uh, um, one thing I, I share with my children over and over and over again is do not be the same person next year that you were this year. Something's got to get better. Um, that's the principle of life is growth and development. That's what living things do. They grow and develop. <laughs> um, so it's all important or else you're, you're condemned to be forever who you are right now. And what kind of life is that? Like, I'll, someone once said something that, that created for me a scary thought, and that's living the same day over and over again for 50 years. That's what you're stuck with if you don't go and develop. Also, you see new things. You can do new things. You expand your capability. You expand your capacity. And that just takes you places that are new and exciting. So are you reading any books? Or are you doing anything right now to like that's like really piqued your curiosity that you've like gotten into? Yes, I, I read a book about the Premier League over overseas and how they, they went from being kind of like this scruffy living room type ordinary pastime to being one of like the powerhouses in sports entertainment. And that that is fascinating and because I, I was when I started Rampage, I was all about the players. I want to serve the players. I want the players to profit from their skill. Um, but then I thought about the fans. And that's what this book taught me. Well, fans are going to enjoy this. Fans are going to want to see this. And so reading that book kind of helped me to see it from a fan's perspective and helped me to present it in a way that fans would enjoy. So let's talk about Rampage, because I, I really want to spend a lot of time diving into this because I am super curious about, like, how do you have this idea of starting an entire league or team from scratch and actually take that into fruition? I mean, you started this a long time long time ago and you're continuing to grow and to develop it but like this idea came to you when like when did you start processing mm -hmm. rimpage even in its earliest stages earliest earliest stage of rimpage was just me getting a flash of insight and writing it down oh that's interesting i should write that down and i kept doing that and pretty soon my my notes just started growing and growing eventually i switched to taking notes on on my notepad on my phone and that just started growing and growing how long Early ago was, was that? 2009. Okay. 2009. And it started with just this idea. Something's not right here. Something's missing here. That That's an ENTP. Something about <laughs> basketball could be improved. <laughs> Something about the way we're doing things could be improved. And then when I watched my brothers go through their experience, when they had exhausted all of their eligibility in college. Now, remember, I traveled with the team, so I got to know their teammates as well. And I watched them all grapple with the question, what now? I'm not eligible to play in college anymore. My two brothers got NBA scouts or got an NBA agent, um, Carl Poston. He was 
And so he got them workouts and things with different teams around Texas. Ultimately, none of it turned into a contract. But hearing my brother's experiences about what happened in those camps kind of showed me professional sports in a new light. We had always heard growing up, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a professional basketball player. And everyone would say the same thing. Well, you know, they only take 1%. You know how hard it is to get in the NBA. And so our, our idea was, okay, I just need to be good enough. If I'm good enough, I'll, I'll get in. What we learned is being good enough is not always good enough. Yep. There are a lot of other reasons why players never receive that contract. So, so what, yeah. what are some of those reasons? So if anybody's listening in that doesn't um, understand this process, like what are some of those reasons that you may be good enough, but you may not actually go in and play professional sports? Well, here's one that I think is the perfect fit. And this is a story my brothers relate to me. They have went to an NBA camp and they were they were scrimmaging and this one guy was killing the the team who's already on contract or under contract and they stopped the guy and they said hey we already have our star we need role players and he's like but i'm killing your star i'm better than him yeah. like no we you you're just not a fit and so that's the thing you you can't just be good enough you have to be a good fit for that team there are other other situations where a player is on the roster simply because of how good he is in the locker room he gets the guys together. He's like their, their kind of like a spiritual leader or, or emotional leader of the team. Doesn't really contribute much on the court, but he's invaluable in the locker room. And so you can outplay him, but you don't get his spot. So just things like that happen. You have to get along with the coach. They have to like your attitude and all of that. There are, there are a lot of reasons there. So how, like, and I don't really want to dive into, I guess, like, but from the lens of like being the brother of that and experiencing what your brothers were going through, because like you said, this was a passion and this was something that they were like 100% wanting to go into. Like, how did that feel watching that journey unfold for them as their, as their family member, because you right. were involved in it too. It was just right. a different kind of involvement. It, it stings. It stings because you're watching these people on TV and you're thinking I could do that. Yep. I just didn't get the opportunity. And you hear about this player who like one guy, the, his coach lied and got him into a McDonald's event. And then that's when he got noticed. And then his, his, he sort of took off from there. And then another coach um, got with his high school player and worked out with him at 6 a.m. every day before high school and just developed him and groomed him. You hear these stories about guys who get opportunity and they kind of get on this path. And that path is what takes them there. There are a lot of guys who are good, but they can't either either they can't get on that path or they can't stay on that path long enough to get a contract. And so it, it's it stings knowing I'm good enough. I'm, I'm good enough to do that. And here I am. Nobody knows about me in obscurity. And I I can play just as well as these guys. So you like you started jotting down all of these notes in 2009 and then you watched your brothers go through this entire process and you were kind of living that pro that process as well, even though you weren't necessarily on the court. So like at what point were you like, you know what? I'm going to pull all of this together and I'm going to put structure and I'm actually going to launch rim page or whatever like idea or name you had for it at that time. Mm -hmm. It was, it was 2017. That's when all of the notes and all of the insights and all of that stuff crystallized for me. And I knew exactly what rim page needed to be a one-on-one -on -one basketball league. And so I, how I did that, like, how did it crystallize though? Like what, because there's so many people that have so many brilliant ideas, but they don't do anything with them. Right. Or they don't like follow through with that vision. So like you had that happen in 2017 and you were like, this, this is what I got to do right now. And what, like, so where did that come from? Was it based on spiritual? Like what, what, like what made you make that decision to actually move forward with it? I think, okay. I knew that, I, I had already come across the personality type research. I knew that I had I was best suited to be an entrepreneur. And so that kind of strengthened me, my confidence and my ability to do a business. Now the, the, the task was which business? And so I, I had a graphic design agency. I was a freelance graphic designer. I was doing that. I also wanted to start like this, um, kind of like vines, like short videos. That's That was initially the idea for Rimpage, just short videos, um, basketball highlights and stuff, just a basketball website. But it was when I, I looked at the UFC and the one-on-one -on -one style and this climb to the top from obscurity to the top to where you're, you've beaten everyone and you're holding the belt. And then I, I thought about, looked at that and said, that needs to be done in basketball. It's 
it, that's where the one-on-one -on -one concept came from. And that's when it just took off. That's when it crystallized. When I said it needs to be a one-on-one -on -one lead. Up to that point, I just knew it needed to be a basketball website. But when I made that connection, that's when I said it, it's got to be a one-on-one -on -one lead. So what did you do next? Like when you decided, you know what, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Like, cause you didn't have a background. Like, did you have a background of launching companies? I know that you had the magazine, but like you didn't have the formal background of like, I've built big companies before and I'm going to launch Rimpage, which is a totally different. It's almost like a totally different scenario, even though it's right. intentionally congruent. Right. So like, when you made that decision, what happened next? Like, did you no. have the resources or like kind of what was your process there? Honestly, Amanda, it's like the vision was going and it saw me and said, that's who we need. And the vision just snatched me up and took me along with it. I kind of feel like I'm an ambassador of the vision. Like it almost didn't that. come from me. I'm, it chose me. The vision chose me because it knew that I would do whatever it takes to get this, to make it real. And so no, I didn't have a background building companies. I was a freelance graphic designer. I knew I wanted to start a business at one point, um, but I, I had read this book that was like this thick and I, I couldn't get through the first chapter with all those big words and all those fancy terms and stuff. It intimidated me and I put that book down and I put down the idea of starting a business for years. It wasn't until I read this other book and it simplified business for me. It's a um, personal MBA by Michael Kaufman. Um, he I'll draw, explains I'll draw what a link to that book yeah, in here. We we don't we're not book. like we're not promoting, right? But like I want to drop that book because right. that's a that's a really good resource. Yeah, that book. one's pivotal for me. When when he explained that every business is simply a continuous flowing of five processes, and he explained what those processes are, then I, I said, okay, I can take that and run with that, and I still use it today. That's what gave me the confidence to start a business. Do you think a lot of people before they they make that shift or like before they launch a company overcomplicates it to some degree? I think we do. Uh, and I think one of the struggles of being a visionary is in your head, seeing the whole thing already accomplished <laughs> and then having to pull yourself back to where you are right now and put this period at the end of this sentence and make this website web page work. Just all the little technical things, little practical things <laughs> that drive you crazy because if I could just snap my finger right now and, and make rim page real, like the full vision, I would do it. Um, but it's, it's all those little steps. And so, yeah, I think that's part of the discipline that you have to have to go through and, um, so and, and become rim good page? at Like share with the audience, like if they're not familiar with rim page, like what is it? What are you building? Okay. For players, rim page, I want you to just think of one word opportunity. Rim page is doing for basketball, what Amazon did for the book publishing industry. I'll give you an example. Before then, a, an aspiring writer would write a book, 2,000 pages, 20-chapter book. Now that the book's finished, he sends it into a publisher so they can say, your book is good enough to share with the world. And, they, and so inevitably, he would get a, a rejection letter. No, it's, it's just not a good fit for us. He sent it to another publisher, another one. These publishers are gatekeepers. They decide that your work is good enough for the world to read or not. And here comes Amazon, who says, we'll publish your book. And we'll let the world decide if it's good enough. We won't publish it. We won't print it until someone buys it. And so that takes away the risk. And now all these books are just being published and they're bypassing the gatekeepers. YouTube did the same thing with entertainment, the entertainment industry. You have the entertainment industry says, uh, we pick you. We're going to make you a star. And so when we were growing up, if you see someone on TV, if they point a camera at someone, they must be pretty important. Now we have these cell phones with cameras. Anybody can point a camera at themselves. Yep. And so once again, you can bypass the gatekeepers. People are getting famous, world famous on YouTube and on TikTok. Um, well, so and basketball. not just that, like want to give a shout out to this. Like there are a lot of people that I've met in person that use all of these crazy filters. And so it's not even like <laughs> <laughs> the, the method of like reality is like completely different, right? So it's right. even taking away some of that filter that may or may not be up there. So sorry, right. I didn't want to, but I just wanted to throw out there. I absolutely hate filters. Yeah, and what it allows them to do is bypass the, the gatekeepers and take their content to the world and let the world decide. If you get zero views, you must not be that good. But some people get millions of views and that they were skipped over by the, the big broadcasting agencies. And so with Rempage, what we're doing is the same thing. In the NBA, you have 
the NBA, I believe the last that I heard is they're taking three out of every 10,000 eligible athletes. My brothers were among those who, who were skipped over. Three out of every 10,000, that's less than 1%. So the NBA is the biggest stage in basketball in terms of popularity, but in terms of capacity, it's actually a pretty small stage. They only have so many teams, and those teams only have so many roster spots. And if you had 1,000 Michael Jordans after 15, you can't take him more. It doesn't matter how good he is. You just don't have the space on your roster. And so you have the 99% that sort of falls away. Rimpage was created for the 99%. Cent, the 99%. So what we're doing is creating a big stage. We have unlimited capacity. If you believe you have a special ability, get on the stage and show the world what you can do. If you're great, you truly do have something special, you're going to get all the rewards that your skill deserves. There's absolutely nothing holding you back now. A lot of the players I've interviewed, um, they all say the same thing. I don't get the opportunity. It's hard to get on those big stages. That's the problem we're solving. So you pick yourself. If you think you're good enough, join Rimpage. And your record, your ranking, all of that will speak for itself. So for how does fans, your record and ranking work? Like, is so it's a one-on-one. -on -one, like, how does this work? So, like, for people that are listening that aren't familiar with this, like this, like, so if I'm a basketball player and I have not made it to the NBA, but I would love the opportunity to become part of what you're doing. Like, what does this mean for me? Like, it's how does it actually work? Because it's well, fascinating to me. Like, I'm fascinated with how it actually works. Yeah. It works around one question that we're seeking the answer to. Who's the best basketball player in the world? We want the answer to that question. So we're going to find our answer systematically. First, we're going to find out who's the best basketball player in every city. Once we have city champions, they will compete to see who's the best in the state. State champions will compete to see who's the best in the country. Once we have 200 national champions, we're going to put them in a tournament. It's called the Lions Tournament. We're going to find out who's the best basketball player in the world. No more speculation. We have a systematic way of finding that out. We're going to be the first league in history. Basketball has a 76-year history. No league has ever revealed who is the best basketball player in the world. They can give us the best team, and then they let us argue over who's the best player. Um, but we're, gonna, we're going to give that answer. So the way it works is in order to find out who's the best in the city, we have rankings and we have ratings. You play one-on-one -on -one matches. If you win, you get five points. If you lose, you lose five points. The more you win, the more points you get, and then there are levels. Once you reach a certain number of points, you advance to the next level. Once you, and then once you get, meet the next requirement, you advance to the next level. So the top tier players are gonna be easy to find. You can look at that top level. That's where they're gonna be. Also, the ranking will rank you in your city and your state. So if you're ranked 3,000, then you know there are 2,900 other players, 999 players that are better than you. And so, by winning, that's really all you have to do. And that's that's what I say. All you have to do is win. When you join Rimpage, all you have to do is win. All the rewards will find you. All the fans will find you. Just win. And that's how you raise your ranking. That's how you raise your rating. So, like, if I'm an existing NBA player, right, is this something that I'm able to do as well? Absolutely. And, and here's why. Because our search is pure. What I mean by that is we just want the answer to the question, who's the best player in this city? If you're an NBA player and you think you're the best, get on here and show it. That's the other thing. We're not no more arguing about this stuff. Well, I'm better than you and I'm going to do this. And, no, get on the court and prove it. That's the best way to determine who's best. Make the two of them play each other. Whoever wins in a fair competition, you can't argue that they're, they're not the best. And so when we start crowning city champions in Los Angeles and Denver and Chicago and the NBA player to say, Rempe city champion, I'm, I'm in this city. And then I'll just say, okay, well, get on run page and compete. Play against our city champion. So and if you turn out. What cities are you in now? Like, are you said, so what cities are you like live and operational in now? We, we are starting in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. So there are 15 cities in that, that area. That's where we're, where we are right now. We're going to find the best player in the Metroplex. <laughs> Matches have already started and we've already got some, some really nice talent that we found. Does this like tap into the like the competition that you used to like as a kid? Like it sounds like you like competition was just a core like component to you growing up and like how you interacted with your family. <laughs> like this sounds super highly competitive and a lot of fun. But does that tap into some of that from like your childhood? Absolutely. Because we we were so intensely competitive growing up. The um Michael, <laughs> Michael Jordan had this video called Come Fly With Me. And we watched that video, and in the video, he says. There's this part where he says, my brother used to beat me all the time, 
But when I grew up, when I got older, I, my skills began to develop and I got a little height and I began to beat him convincingly. He said that word, beat him convincingly. <laughs> and so my older brother heard that and he looked at us. You'll never beat me convincingly. And so there was this, this competition. We all wanted to get to that level. <clears throat> we all wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Um, but then my mom sort of polished that and she had this no quit attitude and and she had a refined eye for talent and she would pick out little things and say, do this and do that. And and that just heightened the whole competitive uh, atmosphere for us. So yeah, it's, it's intensely competitive. We And that's why like starting out, I'm not, I'm not gonna give you any advantage nature doesn't give you. I wanna know who's the best without all of these constraints and filters and things. And so for that reason, it's open to women. Uh, all you have to do is be age 15 and up. If a woman happens to be the best in that city, let her be the best. We're, we're going to show her. Interesting. So we've got, okay. So Lorenzo's popping in here. He says, for liability purposes, how would this work with NBA players, sports agent, and NBA executives? And I don't know that maybe this is like a follow-up kind of thing, but I'm curious as well on like kind of this, this aspect of it too. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you, um, if you intend to play in, at the college level and at the pro level, some of them have issues with you giving up your amateur status. When you join Rempage, you are full on pro because you're, you're able to compete for rewards and that's what makes you a professional. So yes, you do give up your amateur status and that's up for you to decide if, um, if that's the step you wanna take. Ultimately, when the vision is fully realized, Rempage will be able to offer top tier athletes everything that they can get from being a top athlete in the NBA. So you will actually have a choice. Um, that's where we're headed. So until then, yeah, you, you have to decide, am I willing to give up my amateur status to, to see how far I can make it with Rimpage? Now, that's, that's for the other leagues and for the colleges, that's their restriction. But with Rimpage, you don't have to say no to them to say yes to us. So you can absolutely compete in the NBA and be a Rimpage player at the same time. Interesting. Okay, so we've got, so we actually have Jason popping in here. He says he's an ENFJ as well. Ah, <laughs> for the people. <laughs> <laughs> Do what? I said for the people. You you guys inspire. Like my goodness, you you make you take people who who see themselves as ordinary and you show them their brilliance, and then it's like you light a fire under them. You you all are really good at that. That is what we do. So Jason also asked the question. He said, when you think of Nike, everyone knows that stands for just do it. When someone says Rimpage, Rimpage Basketball Club, what do you want others to know what that club stands for? And equally important, what does Patrick Johnson stand for? Uh, what, what Rimpage stands for is opportunity. Now there's th – this is an exciting time for sports because – it's not just a new league, it's a new kind of league. We're introducing a new model where there are no more barriers. There, there, there are no scouts. There is no draft lottery. It's you. If you believe you have a special ability that's worthy of an audience, pick yourself and get on stage. So it, it stands for opportunity. Rimpage stands for opportunity. We, we're taking the shackles off these players. There's no one standing in your way. No one standing between you and the rewards that your skills deserve. Go after it. Um, what I stand for, I, I kind of see myself as just an ambassador for this. I, it's my job to make this thing real. And if, if no one knows my name, but I accomplished that, I'm happy. What are some of the challenges that you faced? So if somebody was like, oh, I'm just going to launch a basketball league, like there's so much that goes into this. And as you continue to grow, like you're kind of in startup mode still to some degree, like you're, you're focused on growth and expansion and all these other things. But what are some challenges that you've faced that may be, you know, some things that listeners can can learn from? Well, early on, the big challenge was no one's ever done this before. So I don't have a template to follow. I don't have a roadmap. I don't have anything that I can refer to and say, oh, when I get to this point, I'm supposed to do that. But I saw this video once. It was uh, Seth Golden was giving a talk. And when I came away from that video, I had an understanding. And that is, since no one has done this before, I'm gonna to have to learn from failure. Failure is gonna to have to be my teacher. I'm gonna try this thing and if it doesn't work, I'm gonna figure out why and make an adjustment and try again and just kind of step-by-step step learn from my failures. That was huge because it, it meant now failure is my friend. I can go out there and do it. Um, was that hard and, to switch over? Was that like a hard mindset thing to switch over for you? Is like, 
just understanding that failure was the template and like yeah. that and accepting failure. Yeah, it was because nobody wants to fail as you fall on your face and it doesn't feel good. It just flat out doesn't feel good. And so nobody wants that experience. And, that, and so you naturally try to protect yourself from that experience. And the answer is don't try, don't do it. Cause if you do it, you might fail. But once I learned that I, I saw it as imperative. I have to do this because no one else is going to teach me. I have to learn from the result of my action. And so I, I have this thing called the LPT wheel. It's learn, prepare, try, learn, prepare, try. So you, you start off with an intention. This is what I want to do. Okay, go learn a little bit about what might help you to do that. Once you learn, stop the learning. Now it's time to prepare for an attempt. Prepare and then try. And now you have a result. And that's so much better um, than speculating and dreaming and wondering and wishing and waiting. When you actually try, now you have an intention to evaluate. You have an, an execution plan to evaluate. What did I actually do? And then you have a result to evaluate. And that, you, you can go with that. You can make... You can make some headway with that. So what, like, what else have you learned in, because you, once again, you're going down this journey that nobody's ever done. So like entrepreneurship can be very isolating at times, yeah. right? And so throughout this journey, like, are there people or resources or like, I'm, I'm thinking through like the community aspect of it, because mm -hmm. like I said, entrepreneurship can be very, very isolating, especially when you're doing things that haven't necessarily been done again or have a have a framework to them. So are there like how did you navigate that piece? And are you looking for like specific connections or resources? Like, yeah, absolutely. What does that look like? For you? I want to talk first about that, that isolated part, because I think it's it's um it's something that all entrepreneurs Come to grab to uh, come to grips with, and that's this thing that you're creating has absolutely no value up until the moment it has value, and so up until that moment, when the world says we love it, up until <laughs> that moment, it's nothing. <laughs> it's absolutely nothing. But yet, you have to treat it like it's something, with all the seriousness, with all the commitment, with all the dedication. You pour into this thing to make it something, and then you present it to the world, and then there's this moment where the world says. Mm, we hate it <laughs> or, or, or the world says, yes, give us more of this. Yeah. So there's that, that, that you have to deal with in terms of resources. My, my team, that's uh, that's a big struggle now because I'm, I'm getting overwhelmed with the response from the athletes and I'm not able to execute at the speed that I would like to. Um, another one is I want the sponsorship and the fan base the endorsement from the businesses um, that just gives us more capital to work with to accomplish some of the things that we want to do and, and make this vision real. Those, those are pretty real. So what, like, what does this mean for the fans? So you mentioned it a little bit earlier on like the fan experience and like, not just the player experience, but that you learned a lot from the Premier League about how critical that component is to it. So, like, how right. are you going to incorporate the like, what are your thoughts around the fan experience and how how you're intending to create that for the people that tune in? Well, very simply, what Rampage means for fans is mega basketball entertainment. <laughs> We're talking about a league that has unlimited capacity. My vision, 100 million Rampage athletes worldwide. Now, top, let's say top 1% of NBA athletes, you have what, maybe 10 players who are at the very top. Imagine a thousand top tier athletes because we're, we're, we're pulling from all over the world, ultimately. So you'll have the city champions from all over the world, state champions from all over the world, national champions from all over the world. And wherever Rampage goes, we're bringing our camera. So we're going to show fans like the, the nuances and the differences in styles and skills and preferences um, in all of these different places. They don't play in Denver the same way they play in Houston. They just value different things. I, I was talking to a guy in Nigeria. I had some, some guys who were interested over there and I was asking them, tell me about basketball in Nigeria. And he said, we love the slam dunk. We want to slam it in your face. <laughs> so, so when these guys get on rim page, that's what you're going to, what fans are going to see. Everybody's trying to slam it in a guy's face. When you go overseas or on, in another area, they might like the three point shot, the distance shot and that. So there are all these nuances to the game that fans are going to get to see. Um, we're just going to open up a wide view to all of these different areas. So that's one thing. The other thing is, 
that Lions tournament I, tur I told you about, that's going to be of Olympic sized proportions. Just try to imagine the national champion from 200 com countries competing in one tournament. And it's going to go all the way down to two guys. The whole world is going to be watching to see who wins that. The guy that comes out of that tournament will be the certified irrefutable best basketball player on the planet. Bas basketball fans have been waiting over 76 years for that, for the answer to that question. <laughs> who's, who's the best player? Like we speculate, but we'll, we I, didn't get to see Michael Jordan play Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We didn't get to see. This like, this is fascinating to me. And for anybody that's tuning in, like entrepreneurship is such an amazing journey, but it is a long game play. And there's so many resources along the way and people that come alongside the journey to support each other. And so I'm always fascinated with like hearing your long-term vision because it's a big vision. It's never been done before. And you're taking the incremental steps needed and you have a clear defined roadmap on how to actually get from point A to point B. So like, I am so cheering you on. Like I am your biggest fan <laughs> and supporter through this journey because I just have so much admiration for people that take ginormous visions and say, you know what? This is my vision and I'm going to put the incremental st steps needed and I'm going to have the focus and the discipline to execute this thing. And you're Thank on you. that journey. And so it's such an amazing journey to watch. Um, Thank you. Well, you know what? One thing that makes it easier is, yes, ultimately, the vision is the Lions tournament, 200 national champions in an Olympic sized tournament to determine the best player in the world. But what makes this easier is I can I can start at the city level, just find out who's the best player in the city. And that's sort of where I am now best player in, in Dallas, best player in Fort Worth, best player in Carrollton. And then at the end of the season, find out who's the best player in Dallas, Fort Worth. And then we just kind of go from there. Once we have city champions, we can move up to the state level. And then we can just sort of incorporate the rest of the United States and then expand overseas. So we, we have the opportunity to really hone in on one specific area and focus there and then take those lessons learned. So when we expand, we can just execute that winning template. Well, I am cheering you on. And for anybody that is watching in, this is the website. So definitely go and check out the website for anybody listening in. It's www.rimpage.club. So definitely go check that out. And any like, I could literally talk to you all day, every day. And every time you and I get on the phone, we talk forever yeah. <laughs> yeah. because it's, it's, it's so, um, it's all about ideas and creativity and right. like leveraging, right. like how can we support each other through our crazy journeys, individual journeys, but also the journeys that'll coincide at some point. So for anybody tuning in, are there words of wisdom or any like parting thoughts that you would love to share with them? Absolutely. And it is, it is this, I believe, um, well, first of all, as, as you've explained, I'm a man of faith. My faith informs my worldview. Um, so it's number one in my life, love God, love people. Um, also from that, I, I get this, God always gives you what you need to take the next step. Maybe not the next five steps, maybe not the next 10 steps. Some people want all the steps before they get started, but you always, always, always have what you need to take the next step. So just in faith, take that step. Once you've taken that step, what you need to take the next one will be given to you. So if that's true, then there's never an excuse for just sitting around waiting. There's always something you can do to move the vision forward. That's a huge lesson. Um, so that means get busy. <laughs> get to it. <laughs> There's, get off get, of this call. Get off of this live and go do something. <laughs> get to it. Uh, another thing I want to say that, that's really important about Rim Pages is what we want to do for athletes ultimately. We have a, we have a new definition of, of what a professional athlete is, and it's a business professional who leverages athletic ability to create generational wealth. Yep. Now imagine how a league would treat its players when that's how it sees them. It sees them through that lens. And so this is sort of where my work with you would come into play. I want to educate and groom these players so that we can take street ball players and turn them into savvy business professionals. That's what we want to do for these players. And I don't want to talk too much or reveal the strategy too much, but it's not just about basketball. It's about teaching street ball players how to leverage this thing they have, which is their basketball talent, to create generational wealth. There won't be players retiring from Rampage Broke because we're going to train them and teach them how to make the best use of, of that talent they have and profit from it.
so if somebody's tuning in and is curious on your like maybe potentially collaborating with you or you know exploring more about like how they could potentially partner or stay in touch with you like what's the best way to do so don't give phone numbers but but what's the best way to stay in contact with you and to watch your journey as this continues to to go forward definitely the website rempage.club um we, we post stats and and standings there player profiles are there as well so if you want to get to know the players and follow them, um, all of their stats are there. Profiles are on the website. Um, Rim Pages Instagram page, Rim Page underscore BC. That's another great one. Um, but also, if you want to watch the matches, they're going to be on Rim Pages channel on AOSports.tv. AO Sports is our media partner, so all of our events will be on, on their platform. So we, I'm going to drop name. some of these links in the comments so people yes, can do. have access to them. Um, and for everybody tuning in, thank you so much for listening into the show. Patrick, thank you for joining. Like I have been waiting to have this episode because yes. I know we put it on the <laughs> calendar for a little bit. And I'm just so impressed with everything you have going on. But most importantly, who you are as a human and the work and the passion that you have for other people. Like it's, Thank you it's so, so much. inspiring <laughs> and I'm so excited to continue to cheer you on and to, to watch your journey and how you're actually bringing this thing to life. And thank yes. you. Like, thank you for coming in and spending <laughs> the time to, to share with everybody. Always good to spend time with you, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All righty. And until next week, we'll see you. We'll see you later. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Bye-bye everyone.